Greetings folks, I'm Will Lombardi and I'm here at the Capital Arts Gallery with the featured artist for June, uh, Lori Reed. And Lori's what I would describe as a multimedia artist who works in paint, pottery, and fabric. Is that a fair uh, description? Yeah, and as many other mediums as I can get my fingers into. I love it. Uh, so greetings, welcome, and thank, thank you. you for doing this. Thank you for having me. Um, my first question is simply to give some background about who you are and about your relationship to your art. Uh, so I'm just, can you tell us about yourself, where you're from, where you live and work now, maybe something about <laughs> your training? Um, I, was, I was born in Long Island, New York moved to Vermont when I was not quite four. Um, I, my earliest memory is the Christmas that I was three, I received a package of colored pipe cleaners and I remember making little animals out of them, you know, bending them into little animals. And there's no photos of that. So I know it's a real memory because I, you know, I could see myself at, at the coffee table doing this and, um, I, I believe I was born to be an artist. I was born to create. And I, my parents told me, no, you don't want to be an artist. You want to do something practical. And, <laughs> and it's like, it took me years to get to a point where it's like, you can't tell me what I want. <laughs> um, because I, it's just always what I did. I always was, you know, just making little things. I was very nearsighted. And I could only see like four inches in front of my face in, in focus, so I was always doing little tiny things up, up close. So it's kind of ironic that eventually, um, after doing mundane, everyday jobs like cashiering at a grocery store and stuff like that, I discovered that I can make a living in art, and I became a faux finisher, which is doing walls. And suddenly, instead of doing little tiny things, I was doing great big things. And that grew into murals, and um, that's been my career for more than 20 years. I hope we get to circle back to that, because that is really fascinating to go from minute detail into this grand scale. So it seems like scale somehow yeah. is a theme in your work? Well, I, I tend to just do the bigger things now. Um, contact lenses had a lot to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, it's because I had to, you know, glasses, you, glasses limit how you can see. And of course, art is visual, and I'm a very visual person. And so um, it was really important to me to be able to see what I was doing. And contact lenses really helped a lot. I've also had LASIK surgery. and. That didn't work for me, but anyway. Um. So most of your, or I shouldn't say most of your, but it seems like from what I understand, your training was in Vermont. You were largely, after moving to Vermont as a child, you were then largely trained in Vermont. I, I don't actually have a lot of training. Uh -huh. I um, learned to do pottery at a place called Frog Hollow Craft Center in yeah. Woodbury, Vermont, uh -huh. when I was a teenager. Uh -huh. And I, I apprenticed there for a couple of years. I did go to Skidmore College in New York as a fine art major, but I didn't finish college. Um, I, I like to teach. I found that I can teach anything that I have been taught. Anything that I have learned, I can teach. But anything that's in me, I can't teach it. Like, I can, I can paint pictures, I can't teach you how to paint a picture. Uh -huh. I can teach you how to sew. Uh -huh. I learned how to sew when I was 12. <laughs> you know, but I can't teach you how to paint because I don't know how I paint. I just do it. So if we're, if we are thinking of perhaps your evolution as an artist, you, you say you were doing the, these small sort of detail-oriented things. Um, it sounds like you began sewing, which would be the basis for your fabric art around 12. It mm -hmm. sounds like as a teenager you began with pottery 
and then on your own you evolved into a painter is that yeah yeah um i could when i was a kid i could draw uh -huh. anything i didn't do much painting i took uh, i think when I, I was about eight when i took a you know a, like four week uh -huh. class at frog hollow with oil painting and i did one oil painting uh -huh. um my sister confiscated that. It's on the back of her aquarium. It's an oh. underwater scene. <laughs> um, and then I took uh, one, you know, again, just like a four week or six week class when I was maybe 14. And I haven't ever had painting. So it just sort of, but I can draw. And so when, when I get into my art, it's like I'm drawing and I can draw with almost any medium. I can, I can draw with clay and glazes. I can draw with fabrics. I can draw with pencils and crayons and, and paints. Um, there's, there's a mosaic down there. And I still was drawing with the pieces as I was doing the mosaic. I was still drawing. So I, you know, even though I don't actually draw with a pencil very much, most things that I do, I find myself making. So, uh, this is fascinating to me. It sounds to me like these waves of creation or creativity have hit you and have drawn you in different directions as an artist. And so I think my question then would be, uh, are you more attentive to a specific medium or mediums now, today, or is it rather uh, as the impulse strikes you? It, I'm impulsive. <laughs> yeah, I go from one thing to another and, and then I'll have an idea and it's like, oh, I gotta get into that. And, and um, yeah, and then, and then I get a job doing a mural and it's like, okay, well, I have to do this. And I mean, I just finished one of the most fun jobs I've ever had. Uh -huh. You know, it's like, I just, I love doing that. I get into the little animals and details. It was for a veterinary office. And so we had lots of little animals. Oh, I love it. And, um, and apparently that's what I'm good at is the animals. I don't, I don't do people and I don't like doing things that man made. I like nature and the animals. So. Um. So that, that was sort of, I think, where I, where I was headed was um, you, we, we spoke just before we began this interview and I asked how to characterize your different art forms. And it does seem like uh, you have this fine art to be hung in a gallery and then there's this more commercial aspect yet still fine art sounds to me how it is the way you had characterized your faux finishing or your mm -hmm. your murals etc right. so can you speak to perhaps uh, are those separate impulses and or how does this commercial side affect what you're able then to do um, in terms of, of your more uh, fine art gallery specific work? Um, well, I've, had a, I've had a theme throughout my life where I, oh, I usually go toward trees. You'll notice there's a lot of trees. And if it's not trees, it's probably green. Um, and I was working at a nursery, a plant nursery, when they had someone come in and finish the gift shop. And she, on top of a door frame, she painted a little bird's nest with a bird in it. And I went, oh, I can do that. And that's when I started uh, faux finishing. I've had four trainings and that all over the country. Um, and uh, as soon as I started doing the faux finishing, Faux finishing is something that anybody can learn. Any, any house painter could learn faux finishing, but there is an art to it because you know you got to make it go with the interior design and blah, blah. There's a certain artisticness. 
but that developed into the murals as well, and not anybody can do murals. That's something that requires a knack. Is there a blurring of that space between the mural and the faux finishing that you are doing on these commercial jobs? For example, uh, I'm thinking of the images I saw of the fireplace surrounds. Um, that to me is a faux finish, and yet I also saw one that almost kind of had a, a landscape growing out of it as at, at the same time. Yeah, the, the, you're thinking of the Tahoe one? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was, okay, that was probably the second most fun job I've ever had. <laughs> um, yeah, that was that was pretty cool. I, I, I got that job because they had a, a beam that had been painted white and they wanted it painted to look like wood and so I did a, a Your wood you know, grain is faux bois. <laughs> um so so I did the wood grain on there and then they had this fireplace and they didn't know what they were doing with it. These the the homeowners were, you know, just completely lost as to what to do with this. And right out their window is this spectacular view of Tahoe. Uh -huh. And they said, well, can you just put Tahoe there? I'm like, sure, <laughs> <laughs> let me have it. And so it was, um, it was fabulous. And I just, you know, it, I'm telling you, it was, it was, it's so much fun to be allowed to just be given an idea and be allowed to run with it. That's, those are my favorite clients when they say, well, you know, I want this. That's what happened with the vet's office that I just finished, the veterinarian's office, is that, you know, she said, I'm from California, I want a California wall. And so I've got the California cliffs there, and then I've got a vineyard, and then I've got um, the, a lupin field, and then I've got the forest, and then we've got Job's Peak, which is a view close to right outside her window. So. You know, You've made almost a cross section from yeah. sea to Sierra. Yeah, sea to, sea to the Nevada desert. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. love it. So, um, yeah, so it it and and I use a lot of the faux finishing techniques in my murals. In fact, when I first started doing murals, I only used faux finishing glaze. I didn't use paint, and um, and I love it because they look really cool that way. But it's really time consuming uh -huh. because it dry slowly and so you know and it's like most people don't want to pay extra for more time but it's adding it dimension to it the adds, a lot, of dimension. Oh, it adds a lot of dimension that's yeah. fascinating so uh the the folks that you're working for then are obviously inspired uh and probably quite thankful for the work that you're doing and that leads me to ask uh what ins where do you gather your inspiration? You've already sort of mentioned that. Is there an artist, though, on top of scenes that may inspire you? And then finally, I'd like to know what you, as an artist, hope to communicate or inspire in your audience. Um, <laughs> I'm really flattered that you asked that, but I'm, you know, you mentioned uh, earlier you mentioned the word form. You were going to ask me about form and I'm like, I can't speak to form. I don't know about form. And I thought, well, form is just the three-dimensional part of art. And, you know, even though most of the time, it was particularly with painting or with the fabrics, it's two-dimensional, so it's shape. The idea is to make it look three-dimensional, which is what the part that's fun for me, is making something two-dimensional look three-dimensional or in the case of the birds and the, like the dog, you know, making it look real. You know, that's the fun part for me, is making it look real. Um, so, you know, as far as my inspiration goes, there's not a particular artist. You know, I, I like a lot of people. I, you know, admire some of the old masters, Leonardo, Leonardo and Michelangelo, you know, I, was the thrill of a lifetime when I finally got to go see the Sistine Chapel, you know. Um, but I don't, it's not like, I, try, I don't try to emulate anybody. Um, I just, 
when somebody asks me to paint the California coast, I find some photos to use for reference and I compile, you know, I, I make a composition from these photos and that's what I do. And, you know, I, um, when the, the fabric things, the little mini quilts here, I had joined a, uh, an art quilt group and every month they would, somebody would throw out an idea and we would all do something around this idea. Like this one right here was supposed to be um, farms or uh, ranches. Mm -hmm. And so I was all proud of myself because this was kind of abstract uh -huh. and I don't usually do abstract. So for me, that was a stretch uh -huh. to do something abstract that actually I thought came out kind of cool, uh -huh. you know, because um, I'm usually busy with those little details, yeah. you know, trying to make it look real. And uh, so that was yeah, kind of fun. Um, and so uh, just to sort of re return then to my question, um, you spoke to your inspiration. Is there something that you would want me or, or other audience members to to f to feel or appreciate in general uh from from your work you know is there are you, you, know, are you painting with intent usually no no i i i don't like competition uh -huh. i won't enter any competitive shows because art is too um subjective to be objectified, uh -huh. and I just, um, I don't think it's fair for one person to say this person's work is better than that person's work because you just like that person's work better. You know, when people come to me and they say, well, why should I pick you instead of this other faux finisher? I'm like, you should only pick me if you like my work better. If you like her work better, go hire her. Don't hire me if you don't like my work better. Uh -huh. You know, I, I don't want to compete. You know, I, I, don't, um, I don't live for accolades. I don't need you to ogle over my stuff. I do what I feel like doing. And if you want to hire me, that's great. I love doing commission work. I love trying to find what it is somebody's looking for and accomplish that. To me, that is the most rewarding thing, is if, you know, like this veterinary, I did the, the vineyard and I put chickens in the vineyard. She has chickens at home and she was thrilled to pieces over these silly little chickens. Uh -huh. You know, they're just chickens and most of them are like this big on the wall. And it's, but she loved them and it's like, that, that is the most rewarding thing to me. It's like, she liked it, she's happy, I'm happy. Wonderful. You know, and I, I mean, each one of these, the, the quilts were, most of these quilts were done because of the, whatever the suggestion yeah. was in the group. Um, some of them I did because I felt like it, like a couple of those tree ones over there because I have to do trees. Uh -huh. <laughs> because everything is trees. <laughs> well, this is a nice prologue uh, to, your, to your artwork and we'll be able to look at separately uh, different pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for talking with me. And uh, you. your, your show is here for the month of June, and folks can follow you on Instagram. Yeah, thanks. All right, thanks a bunch, Lori. So, Lori, uh, the pottery is probably the least represented medium in this show. And yet, in many respects, it seems central to this show. Uh, and I know that there's a story behind at least one of these pieces, <laughs> but are there, are there one or more pieces that you would like to tell us about? Yeah, actually. Um, I was just a teenager when I started, and much of my artwork has re revolved around nature and trees. These leaf dishes I make from, I use real leaves. This is a, a muleier that I wow. press into the clay and form so that it looks like a real leaf. Uh -huh. and, um, so 
you know, I do that, but I love, I love clay, I love the tactile of it, and I like doing new things. Um, these little vases here have uh, lace pressed into them and just funky little things going on. Um, I was at a very difficult place in my life about 10 years ago and uh, where I wasn't feeling validated or, you know, I felt kind of worthless and it was just a, just a challenging time. And so I wanted to make something that represented me. And so I, I came up with these, and now I've, I've done probably a couple dozen of these. I called them, originally I called it a self-portrait vase, and then I thought, well, that's, nobody's gonna understand that. So I just changed it to a portrait vase. And while people still don't understand that, it at least means something to me. And the point is that from tears comes growth. And the shape is, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, the shape is supposed to be something like me. So anyway, that's what that is about. And then uh, a few years ago, I was in a group where we were given an assignment to make a box and decorate the inside the way you see yourself and the outside the way you think others see you. And there were some really introspective things there, but because I was into clay at the moment, I decided to make this little thing on trees because trees make me happy and, and so, all, so, I, so I made this shape irregular on purpose, you know, the, there's, there's little holes in the side and, and they're, you know, they're not symmetrical, I don't like symmetry. And so I had all this, and I fired it. The first firing is the bisque fire, and it came out with this huge crack in the side. And I just was like, I was, like, for a second and a half, I was totally devastated. And then I went, oh, how appropriate that is, because who doesn't see everybody else as a little bit cracked, right? So, I mean, people would come right out and tell me I was crazy, and I was like, okay, so that... That just, that's very appropriate. And um, I finished it with a little wire tree and inside there's um, all sorts of little things that I like, you know, little uh, stones and coins. And I, I seem to collect rocks and sticks and things just like little boys collect bugs. Um, and then there's like a little forest elf there that I suppose is probably supposed to be me. I'm not really sure, but, um, <laughs> anyway, the, the, to me, part of the point of this is that on the outside, the box is really plain because you, you know that old saying, you can't judge a book by its cover. You can't judge somebody by what they look like. And whatever you see, you really can't make that judgment. And you have to go close to it and look inside to see who this person is that you're talking to. And that's why the outside is very plain and slightly cracked. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is interesting. It seems so powerful and so personal, and yet at the same time, you seem committed to the material, as in pressing the actual leaf. Uh, giving a piece texture with uh, something like uh, with, 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 with lace. Is there, is there something more to say there about using the actual thing uh, to, to create these pieces? Um, I, I'm not sure. Maybe. Just, I love nature and when I hike a lot and when I hike, I come home with pockets full of stuff and, and bouquets of leaves <laughs> and just, I bring things home and um, I just, the first year that I did these muleier things um, had been a really wet winter and the muleiers were huge and so I made a whole set of dinnerware. Because huh. they were big enough to do that. I could make dinner plates because wow. I found leaves that were big enough. Um, and uh, one of the pieces that I really liked was I took, um, I took leaves. I took a bunch of the leaves that I had pressed and you know, cut out individual leaves and I made a teapot 
by using different leaves to, I made a leaf to create the spout and to the, make the handle and everything, and little cups that were just leaves wrapped around with a leaf on the bottom. And um, everything is, is leafy and green and to me comes from nature. And it's like, I'm never lost in the woods even if I don't know where I am. And, you know, I've never been lost and been afraid. I'm never afraid to be out in the woods. It's just that that feeds me, and that's partly why I put the trees in here, is because that's what comforts me. That's mm -hmm. what I feel at home when I'm lost in the woods. Well, this is wonderful and exceptional. Thank you. Thanks. Lori, we're now looking at your art quilts, and the thing that is immediately striking is that they are not a traditional massive quilt, so I wonder if you can tell us about this piece, Birch Forest, the technique that you're using, etc. But also maybe if you would you would speak to the the size of the thing, how you are making art quilts your own. You ask such hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sewing is something that I've done since I was a kid. I did, I made clothes for myself. I got into doing alterations through some dry cleaners. I got to a point where I could make any piece of clothing fit almost any body. Um, and probably about 10 years ago, I joined this little art quilt group where there's these women that this is all they do and some of them are incredibly good at it. And I learned from one of them how to do confetti quilting. That's what this one is here. Um, you cut the, the fabrics, different solid colors, into tiny little pieces, and you sprinkle it sort of like confetti, but with intention, obviously. And there are a few other pieces, like the tree trunks you put in with a solid thing. And these, the, the, features on the uh, aspens here are, um, those are done with the machine, the stitching on the machine to create the shading. Uh, then it has a, a sheet of, uh, just a real thin layer of tool over it that holds the pieces down and then you just quilt the entire thing to hold them in place. Um, this was my first confetti quilt that I actually did in the class where I learned how to do it. Um, and of course it's tree themed because that's what I do. And then one time in the art quilt group, the, uh, the assignment was spring. And so I did a spring thunderstorm. And being that I like dimension and texture, I made some little flowers to put on there, but I had these scraps of, of um, just this weird little stuff. Somebody had cut it into tiny little pieces. And so I created, the rain with that um, and I just it's a, it, this is the same thing I being in that group was really a good stretch for me because I had to learn different quilting techniques which I had not done very much of prior to that so it was uh, everything is a process a learning process as long as you're learning, you're growing. Right? As, as you're speaking, and as I'm able to scan the wall, and in particular these two pieces, I wonder if you could just extend this conversation a little bit and discuss color. Because to my mind, as I look at your work, it's, it's quite vibrant. And yet, to, me, to my eye, your use of color even in spring uh, thunderstorm, almost seems a bit muted. Is, th is that fair to say? Yeah, actually, um, that's an interesting observation because I've noticed that myself. It's not intentional. It's, it's not intentional. Um, it just, that's just kind of how I do I I think it comes from wanting everything to look very real. Uh -huh. So I try to use the real color. So for some reason, I've noticed this in my painting, it's like black must scare me because I don't do really harsh blacks. Uh -huh. I have to really work to get that in there. So to see something like this, that was hard for me. And yet you're asking but it works. us, you're <laughs> inviting our eye 
to, to inhabit that quilt in a way that a shocking use of color may not. Uh, to my mind, this is a nice example of you articulating that really near range, detail oriented work that you discussed in our uh, general discussion. You know, I do that. I, I found, I've noticed that in my mirror work too. The backgrounds can be a little bit more vague and muted, but to bring things forward, I just let myself get carried away with the detail and just put lots of detail in there because that adds that third dimension yeah. to the two-dimensional piece. Yeah. Oh, I like it so much. Thank you. Lori, uh, you've mentioned your affinity for the natural world and how it inspires much of your work. And we've looked at these landscapes. Now we're standing here uh, with a painting of a juvenile red tail. Uh, can you speak about um, your engagement with or interest in birds? And in particular, you had alluded to your interest in birds of prey. Uh, maybe you can, you can give us just a general statement and then speak to this image directly. Yeah, I, um, I did a mural with a lot of birds in it many years ago. They were exotic birds you know, tropical parrots, the colorful, pretty ones, and uh, that was, as most of my work is, a commission project. Um, and I discovered that I really liked doing animals. And I've always had a thing for birds of prey. I can drive through the valley where and almost go off the road because I'm so busy looking at the hawks and, and everything. And, I feel you. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was at Spooner Lake one time and with my dog and this something went over my head and I looked and it was a bald eagle and I was like and I said I said please come back to me so I can see you and it turned around and it flew about 10 feet over my head and I was just like wow um, and at that point it was like he, he came to me and I just I started doing birds of prey so this is this is uh, using a photo that I found in a uh, a book one time. It's a juvenile red-tailed hawk. Um, red-tailed hawks, of course, have red tails. That's how you can tell. And this one does not because it's just it's just a juvenile. It hasn't developed those colors yet. Um, but I just there was something about it. I just loved it. I I've never done something quite this size, and it was uh, I just I just wanted to do it. It's like, I see a sunset and I want to paint the sunset. I see a bird, I want to paint the bird. I, you know, you see something beautiful and it makes me want to recreate it, you know, in, in my art. And this is painted with acrylic glaze, not, not paint. And the difference is that um, paint is like paper. If you put a piece of paper over your hand, you can't see your hand because it's opaque. Acrylic glaze is like colored cellophane. You put a piece of cellophane over your hand and you can still see all the details of your hand, but it makes it red or purple or whatever color the cellophane is. And so glazes are like cellophane. They're clear, but they add color. So this is done by building up the colors, basically adding layer upon layer of cellophane or glaze. To, to get the depth that you're looking for. That's fascinating, and, and it does seem like you are striving again for a level of realism uh, to the point where this could be in a field guide. <laughs> uh, and, and as I look at your, your other birds, I, I get the same sense. Um, so all together, you're achieving that that realism through this layering effect. Yeah, yeah. Just always striving to make it look real. <laughs> uh, well, this turned out beautifully. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laurie. Thanks.